All right, I'm Nanette Macy Jones. I'm the executive director of the museum and it is my great honor to welcome you this evening to the opening of two wonderful exhibitions, one on the early work of Roy Lichtenstein, who you don't know, went to Ohio State. Uh, and uh, so he has a deep Columbus connection. We kind of vie with Cleveland for, for Roy Lichtenstein, even though he grew up in New York. Um, and the uh, second is the wonderful exhibition uh, Forward Together, which is the promised gifts of Donna and Larry James. And we had, uh, we're having two programs tonight. Uh, we, we had our talk with the curator for Lichtenstein and now we're having our talk, which will be a conversation. Larry and Donna are going to join me on stage in a few minutes. Um, and so for me, this is Joyce. This is the largest gathering of um, museum family and friends that we have had since COVID started. So it is so good to see you all. And in the midst of great joy, I, I am going to take a moment to have a somber moment to talk. Uh, would you please bring the slide up, Nick, to um, talk about uh, the Ukraine. Um, you know, several times this week, I was uh, cranky about something. I was like, ah, I'm not going right and some aggravating thing about the museum. And I stopped and realized how fortunate I am and all of you are that your museum, our museum, is not in a war zone, that's not in the path of an invading army as our friends are in the Ukraine. Uh, the other thing I think that people don't always think about is that, you know, there's certain jobs in the world that have, uh, have carry a special weight, an extra weight. And actually being a museum curator or director, actually anyone that works in a museum, uh, that weight is there. Many of us, when we leave a, in the middle of a trauma or a war or any kind of tragedy, we can leave our office tower and lock the door and hope that office tower is there when we come back. Curators uh, particularly do not have that, uh, that leisure to do that. They need to take care of their own families, their colleagues, their neighbors, but they also have to take care of the objects that have been entrusted to them. Objects that they are responsible for trying to carry to another generation, forward to another generation. And so our colleagues in the Ukraine are in great distress as they try desperately to take care of precious artworks and cultural objects that are in their care. They are hiding them in basements. They are doing everything they can. And we need to stop and, and I think think about that. Um, during times like that, you pray desperately that international laws that have been enacted to protect art and cultural sites will hold. In truth, they rarely do. Um, because both pa either passively or actively uh, destroying the art and culture of another country is another way of dominating them and controlling them and ultimately erasing the memory of their people. Uh, we know that in our own country, we know that in other countries. So often arts and culture are right in the fray. This week um, already, a small museum that's about 50 miles, you see it burning on the slide, that's just about 50 miles from Kiev, Ivankov Museum. It is a very small museum. It's only existed since 1981. And it held a trove of work by the most beloved folk artist in the Ukraine, Maria Prima, Primachenko, who, is, who died in 1997. 25 works of hers, you see one of them on the screen, and you see her on the screen, went up in flames when that museum burned to the ground. The second thing I wanted to honor was that 17,000 Russian artists and art professionals signed a letter of protest um, of the, about the invasion of the Ukraine. I can't imagine one of us in this room that hasn't signed a letter of protest about something. It's ubiquitous in our country. We, we, we sign a protest letter, we go to a march, and we want people to listen to us. I remind us that in Russia today, each one of those 17,000 people risked their livelihood and their life and their freedom to be able to sign such a letter, but they felt so strongly that they did. The arts have provided such respite for us during COVID. We have been able to find comfort in the arts. 
but also the arts give us courage. Courage to stand up against things that we think are wrong, courage to stand up and help other people. And so I ask, before we start, we return to a joyous program, I ask us all for a minute of silence for our colleagues and the people of the Ukraine. Thank you. And now we'll go back to our program. Uh, Donna and Larry are standing right here. They're coming up. We're going to all sit up here and we're going to have a great conversation together. I have a really long entry, but much of these things we're going to talk about together. So I'm not going to do this. Um, I do want to say, though, that um, uh, in case this is the worst kept secret on the planet, and then it's now been in the newspaper, so it's not even a secret anymore, that I'm retiring at the end of this calendar year. Um, there'll be lots of great moments for this year for me because I've been here so long, but I can't think of one that's going to be greater than this moment because Larry and Donna have talked a long time about, you know, thinking about promising their collection to the museum. And earlier this year, um, they called and said, we not only want to do this, we want to make it public and we want to make it public while you're here. And I can't think of a greater honor. So I'm going to join them on stage and we're going to talk. Oh, aha, it's on. Um, this is uh, a great fun, this is going to be a really fun program to listen to uh, Larry and Donna. We just have some great slides of images of, from their collection that's going to just kind of do a loop behind us. We're, we're just going to kind of talk a little bit. Um, so I thought I would start by saying again how momentous this is for the museum. One of the great uh, one of the priorities we have right now at the museum is to expand our collection in very thoughtful ways so that it reflects the lived experience of all of us. So to diversify and enrich the collection is incredibly important. And this does something huge in one fell swoop, my friends. It's incredible. So let me give you the statistics of this. So Larry and Don. Uh, Donna and Larry, he always yells at me if I don't say Donna's name first. He's right about that. I always tell George he has to say my name first. Donna and Larry are promising nearly 60 works to the collection. There are 28 artists in that collection. Ready for this one? 18 of them are not represented in the collection until this gift. That's a huge change for us. And even then, if there's even, there's a couple artists where we had one, but we now have so much better of a one because of you all. Okay, I'm going to turn this because I have to like look at you. It's like I don't want to be talking. Um, so uh, that's an extraordinary statistic, I think. Um, so I thought we'd start with that, like a, the big question. So, and then we'd come hone in on the collection. But the arts and culture sector that I know in Columbus, arts and culture in Columbus, I know that I have had the privilege to work in really a lot of that is because of you. You've had a huge impact on what our arts and culture sector looks like. And I wanted you to just talk a little bit about what that belief and commitment means to you. Like, how do you, how do you think about that? I'll start. Um, there are a couple people in the audience that kind of shaped me. Um, the first one was Catherine Willis, who is here. And I took over the president of the King Arts Complex in 1987. And Catherine wanted to make sure that I acquired my black card in art. So she said, give me a check for $500. I'm gonna get you past those posters and I'm gonna get you some bit real black art. So she went up to Brown Gallery in Cleveland and came back with that piece. The second person is Betty Stahl, and Betty will remember what the arts community said. I've said this publicly many times, is 
what I knew about art, you could put in a teaspoon and that would have been generous. But what Betty said, you're trainable and we're gonna train you. Well, for me, I feel like there are times when, um, especially now, you see the magnitude of art, not just in the lives of others, but in yourself personally. Because right now, my walls just have hooks at places where the art used to be. And in my heart, I'm feeling like my child has gone off to college again. Now, he's an adult, but I still remember that moment. Um, but to come here tonight and to see how others are enjoying it and embracing it and having conversations around it, you know, it's like, it's okay, I can let go because it's going somewhere where it's going to do more good. And I think that has been kind of the evolution of our collecting is to do more good with it. Um, but it starts here at home, one-on-one, -on -one, and then you just share it with others, family, and now community. The one thing I would add, uh, Gerald Griffin, could you stand? He's the artist from Chicago here that has a couple pieces. Uh, extraordinary. Um, the other person that's not here is Archie Listenby and, and, and what Gerald did and what Archie did for us as our taste grew and our pocketbooks were able to afford our taste, <laughs> it made such a difference. And I, uh, Archie would drive over and the Margaret Burroughs nude sculpture he came in the conference room, he says, you need this for your collection. And I said, I can't afford this. He said, well, I'll just leave it here and you can do payments. <laughs> so that's the way, uh, in, in addition for Don and I, that ar the artists begin to seek us out. Yeah, yeah, which is just phenomenal. And you sometimes you feel like you're saving a piece, meaning the person who has it, something's going on, um, and they need to sell it, but they can't just sell it outright. They need to find another home for it, uh, a place where it's going to be appreciated and taken good care of. And when someone comes to you with a magnificent piece, um, you are figuring out how you're going to afford it because you do want to take over the caretaking of that. And um, we've had a lot of those wonderful experiences. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that fascinates people is, is how you collect, how you find those objects and that network of people that bring them to you. And in your case, how couples collect. And um, I wanted you to tell the story. I mean, you know, we have great Aminas already. We do. I mean, we're, you know, very deeply, you know, devoted to Amina. But the piece that you, know, you bring, actually, one, two, three, four pieces. Uh, well, actually, more if you count the suite individually, which we are. But talk about the piece um, from the, what is now the King Arts Complex, which was the originally the King Center. Talk about that piece, uh, those pieces, because it's a suite of pieces. It's like 15 pieces. Well, my adopted mother, Catherine Willis, came to me and she had these 14 or 15 pieces of Amina uh, that she said were just significant and important. And it was... Uh, I don't know, close to Christmas time. And um, we're in the conference room. I said, Catherine, I, I really can't afford to write the check at this time for that amount. Uh, can I buy two or three pieces? She says, no, you're going to have them. And they stay together and you should have them because you were president of the, of the complex at that time. About this time, my wife walks by and she sees Catherine and she comes in, what's going on? I knew, I knew he was spending money. So she says, I said, well, I don't, I don't feel like I don't want to write that check at this time. She goes, I will loan you the money. And it was, that's the way we required it. And she gave it to me as a birthday present. That was the objective. But what was, what is fascinating in the pieces um, are on the screen now is that they're on the letterhead of the King Arts Complex. And Larry's name is on each letterhead because he was the president of the board at the time. And here is 
Amina um, drawing images of Selma Burke. I mean, the convergence of all of that history, you know, with my husband's name on it, um, and at a time when he was, you know, leading an organization, an arts organization that was important to the entire community, but the nexus of it being in the black community. I mean, there were just so many layers of that, that it's like, yeah, you, we definitely have to have this. And no, you don't have to pay me back. It's a gift. <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I would have made you pay me back. I, I'm sorry, I would have. Um, but I was gonna say as powerful as they, each of those, if each one is individually, together the power of those all together on that wall you could see them downstairs and on one wall they're just extraordinary I, I really think they are um there's an interesting strain of chicago that runs through the collection want to talk about that there's a number of chicago artists why is that well um i was i was on the board at the time and we were going to do a social commentary with art and i'm i'm um, I have dinner set for six o'clock, but I didn't, I forgot the time change and I get there early and I'm looking across the street and there's this gallery, Gerald Griffin's gallery. And, um, I walk over and Gerald and I end up, uh, agreeing that he would come and talk to the, uh, audience on politics, art and, and social commentary. And then David Barker, who really was a mentor in acquisitions, touched base with Archie Listenby, who was head of the DeSaba Museum um, in Chicago at one time. And Archie became that pipeline to art and probably half of our collection at one time was represented by Chicago artists. Uh, and I, I was just, we were just blind lucky. I think luck is for the prepared. <laughs> it definitely comes to the prepared. Um, and so, you know, and again, I think even that connection is about individuals who see someone who is a caretaker. Um, I was talking to someone downstairs and they were thanking us, me. And I said, well, that's nice, but it's a gift from God. And if I can have the opportunity to shelter this gift for the time that I'm here, and then we pass it on to someone else to shelter it, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. So I, I think the Chicago connection saw um, a kindred spirit, so to speak, in you and the art. Yeah. I'm really struck by um, how it takes many hands to build a collection a network of people that uh, care about you, that care about the works of art, that care about the artist. And I'm struck too by the network of the, the many hands it takes to do an exhibition downstairs. When we were walking through, and I, I didn't say this in my open remarks, but here at the museum, I mean, it took quite a team of people. Um, Larry said, I remember you were saying to me, you did a great job, it looks really good. And it wasn't me, I, I you know, I, it was, um, so many people at the museum often who use names you sometimes hear and sometimes you don't. Um, it was uh, Carol Genshaft who wrote all of the copy. Carol went into this quite cold. She's, uh, she learned so much. In fact, she said to me, okay, you missed a piece over there at the house. I was reading about this artist. You need to get another, you need to get that watercolor over there. You got to talk them out of that. I was like, okay, I wrote that down. Uh, so Carol was in a, and, um, uh, Tyler Can, our, our acting chief curator, was was instrumental. Greg Jones and his whole team, uh, Nicole Rome. I mean, there's just a whole team of people at the museum that make it look as great as it does. And we were all, I mean, I know that collection, and some of you know that collection at Fauna and Larry's, and it looks like very different down there. Talk to me about when you walked in, and like, what did you? Well, I, I have to tell this story. Um, we could go out. <laughs> I was I was in Vegas and I got back Saturday afternoon about five o'clock. Sunday, uh, George Miller Black Art Plus emails me a photograph of Raymond Johnson, uh, and it's a painting of William Hawkins, and it just took my breath away. And so I showed it to Donna. She goes, "Is this real?" 
So I shoot it to Nanette, and she said, buy it. <laughs> this is Sunday. And, you know. And I was standing in my bathroom, yeah. and I like texting you from this, my sink. So next thing, I called George. I said, can I pick it up Monday? And so Nanette said, you know, you pick it up Monday and bring it over. We're putting it in a show. And so the hands on the collective, um, you know, when I think about Nanette and the relationship that we've had for 20 years, when I think about Ray Handley, when I think about Tom Katzmeyer, uh, Bill Connor, Denny and Denny Griffin and the Finley, because we were together at the museum and we were just raised by the people I have talked about here because um, I told Don, I said, you know, we're going to be exposed. You know, what we know about, you know, maybe gets to a tablespoon. Uh, but I just think that, you know, one of the things Don and I've always talked about is having the ability to write checks for family and write checks for community. This is reflective of our DNA. So when I first saw the exhibition, the piece that Larry talked about, it never made it to the walls of our home. It went straight, you know, to the museum. So I'm looking at a photo and in the back of my mind, I'm a CPA by training. So healthy sense of skepticism is in my DNA too. Um, I'm going, okay, I hope he authenticates this. Is this real? How do you know? Make sure Nanette sees it and checks it out. Da, 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 right? But he doesn't do any of that stuff. He just buys it and then Fortunately, it is a real deal. But um, so I walk in and I'm amazed to see all of this art that had been on our walls um, and how great it looked in this space because the light is right, the wall space is just perfect. And then I see this new piece and I am blown away. Um, it's overpowering because um, you know how you can see a photo of art and then when you actually see the piece and the, the detail in it and you think about the person who uh, actually created the piece, um, it was that piece was overwhelming to me. And then as I walked around, I'm reminded of either how we acquired it or the story it meant to me. Um, I um, am a breast cancer survivor. And during my recovery and chemo, I was at home. Uh, and this was in 2018. And it can be a lonely existence when you have to stay home so that, you know, your immune system and all that good stuff, you got to watch. But the art kept me company. Um, I couldn't go out in the park and walk around, but I could walk around my house. And so to see this my friends, my babies in a new space. And they looked frankly, very happy. I was expecting them to look a little sad. They are, um, they're very happy. They are very <laughs> happy. <laughs> I think they like attention. So, um, but it was, it brought back um, a flood of memories and joy. And I actually had to step off and you don't know this to the side cause I got teary. And I said, oh, Donna, get it together. We can't see you tearing up. What's going on here? But, um, yeah, it, uh, it was more than a moment. I think the thing for me and um, our growth and cultural competence and appreciation of art and particularly the appreciation of black art, um, Roman Bearden had said something, you know, black art has always been around, but it's very seldom been present. And I think the important for us is to expose the quality for the black artist who is slowly coming into his and her own. And if we can get the museums to acquire, if we can get the public, if we can get corporate Columbus, corporate America, when you walk into their walls and there is diversity, if we can go deeper and the individuals say, you know, I like the way that looks and I'm gonna acquire it. It liberates us, it emancipates us, and it puts flowers in our life. And, um, and you know, you've brought so many flowers into our lives. I thinking about, um, I, I, I'd like to share the story about I Too Sing America, the Harlem Renaissance at 100, 
which would never have taken place without Donna and Larry. Um, I went to the rollout of Will Haygood's book, uh, Showdown, which because of Larry, we had it. The rollout happened here in Columbus, Ohio at the Lincoln. And um, uh, it was, of course, a conversation with Judge Marbley. And I came away from that evening and I was driving back. I, I don't know, I guess I had to go to the museum first. I was driving back and I, I called uh, Sarah Rogers, who used to work at the museum, works at Kent State now, and said, I think we should do, so there was something in what Will said that he must have alluded to the Harlem Renaissance. I said, we should do a Harlem Renaissance anniversary show. And she said, that's a great idea. You should call Bill Connor, who is still with us. So I called Bill on my drive back to Granville and Bill said, this is a good idea. And I said, great. And, and he said, call me in the morning. So I called him in the morning. He said, all right, I already called Larry. Larry's already called Will. And I said, wait, wait, it, it, it's only been like 12 hours. And he said, yeah, we got to go. We got to go on this. And um, what struck me was that it, I had a small kernel of a good idea that would, was turned into an extraordinary idea by Don and Larry. And I, of course, immediately just started focusing on the exhibition that was at the museum with Will Hager. And uh, they stopped me and said, that's a good, we really want the museum to have a great experience and great exhibition, but we need to make this bigger. We need to get other colleagues throughout the arts and culture sector in Columbus. They need to be part of this. And, and we started working on that. And then I remember the day you said to me, listen, there's so many great artists in this community, particularly artists of color that don't have a connection to galleries. They don't know how to sell their works. They don't, they don't have that introduction. We need to create that introduction in this, with this project. And we did. I mean, that's one of the lingering, I mean, you know, really legacy pieces of the project. It's all the artists that met gallerists here in Columbus and whose work now live on other people's walls, right? I, I just think that's, there's so many projects like that that, you know, you two have been integral to. I think that the important thing that I, we learn is that age and success isolates you and segregates you. And you're always trying to figure out how do you reach back um, and how do you connect with other people? And so what we understood and knew that we had to touch some young people because we're old. You're old. <laughs> <laughs> and, Adana is never old. That's yeah. that's not good for the husband view. Not and, no no. And I remember meeting with some of the younger fo folks in Yogi, and he walked in, and I'll just be candid as I said to him, he started taking out his resume and showing me where his wares. I said, you know, Yogi, that's what white folks do to us. I'm not going to do that to you. If you screw up, I'm firing you behind. It's that simple. You're going to get this done. And I think that, and, and I think the emancipation for the artists, they caught fire. They went out and recruited other folks, and it was the joyous journey. And I'll tell you, Nanette collected all the newspapers from Central Ohio, statewide, nationally, that and Washington internet. Post article. Oh, you know what the Washington Post said is New York tried to do this but Columbus got it right. And um, I, I think this, and, and Don and I, I say this collectively, um, we have each other and we have bonded in such a way that we have a collective will that's impossible to stop. So I wanna thank my wife. Well, I was gonna, um, I thought we should leave some time for people to have questions. Um, but I did wanna end with the, the last piece that you um, just acquired literally on Sunday and it came on Monday. Larry said, I'll, I'll be there soon. And he's carrying it up and we, we put it on the, hung it on the wall within 24 hours. Um, I knew Roman Johnson very well. Um, he was a mentor of mine and I am endlessly blessed by having known him. I, when you called me, I thought, of course, Roman is like, you know, wherever Roman is, whatever happens to us, Roman's like, well, damn, I'm not in this, what's going on here? I'm not there. And um, he thought, darling, I got to be there. And he managed to get on the wall too. And I, I love the blend of nationally acclaimed, like Jacob Lawrence, 
The show, by the way, is named, that's Tyler Can. I, Tyler's really good at naming things. I'm really bad at naming things. And he thought uh, the title of the great Jacob Lawrence print in the show is Forward Together. And I think that is a wonderful uh, title for the show. And I, I just, um, I'm in awe of the two of you. And this let, is Let me give a little bit of credit incredible. for the Forward Together. Barbara Nicholson, who for many years was the executive director, was going to DC and she said, write me a check for this amount and I'm gonna bring you a piece back that's gonna blow you away. And there's the tail, there hangs the tail. It's amazing. All right, I'm gonna put my, my mask back on because I'm gonna come up there, out down there with you all because I think I am the only one that has the mask because you don't need to hear me. And you're gonna put your hand up if you got a question for Don and Larry. Here's a question over here. Right here. I'm coming. Wait. I'm really clutching. We're only a week away from October. While she's doing that, I saw David Barker come in. David, thank you. Hi. I had the opportunity to visit your law office once, and I was amazed at the art that was on the wall. I mean, it was incredible, the collection you had. And I wanted to know how that came about and were you part of the responsibility for that? <laughs> um, what happened, uh, our son's here and our granddaughter's here, so you guys cover your ears. Um, we, you know, when we were moving from poster to posters and they got a little bit more valuable, you know, we're given to family and things of that sort. So when they started hitting that thousand dollar mark, then I started bringing pieces into the office. And the office was getting a little bit queasy because I think majority firms, when you bring in a lot of black art, they begin to say, what message are we sending? Are we comfortable with that? After about three months, there was a couple pieces I was gonna take off the wall and send it to my sister the firm rebelled. They were giving tours. And so when we took, when we took the three pieces off the wall to bring to the museum, people were upset. So that's, it's our collection. That's, that's the power of um, yeah, exposing people beyond their front door. Sometimes you've got to bring it to them. And um, once they see it, uh, I think they each have a piece that they plan to take with them at some point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's one, a couple there that are ours now. No, no. <laughs> you know, I was also thinking that as they keep, you know, the loop goes, there's that wonderful Marianne Cook. Another work that's never lived at your house is the Marianne Cook photograph of Michelle and Barack Obama. And um, I forgot now. And the tally piece. The tally piece has never lived at your house. And now the Roman Johnson. The Roman will probably come home to visit with you. He'll want to be over at your house for a while. He won't want that not to happen. I know that. Uh, but the Marion Cook, I, I found that photograph and I was so excited about it. And I didn't have any money. That's kind of chronically my problem. And I called them and I said, I, I really, he said, well, send it to me. Let me see. He said, oh, I have to have that. And they bought it straight out for us to have here right away. It did not even go. <laughs> it's never even been to your, your house. So uh, more, more questions. Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> Stick your hand up again. Oh, there we go. There you go, sir. How are you? Good, how are you? Um, I'm cute now. Now I know where you got that joke that you cracked on me about posters. So now you just outed yourself, sir. Um, but is there any pieces that you just couldn't part with? And if so, tell us about those pieces. I will gladly do that. Um, during the Harlem Renaissance run, um, we acquired a piece by Percy King of Obama. And uh, our granddaughter, Trinity, would you stand up? From the moment that piece hit our doorsteps, she said, that is mine. And I called her and I said, we're donating uh, a lot of our art to the museum. Would you like us to donate that piece in your name? 
She said, absolutely not. <laughs> so I think uh, that's one piece. Um, and I think that's the only piece we've said. Well, there are a lot of pieces that maybe um, I, I, I would not want uh, to part with. Um, and I don't think we will have to, but um, the, um, uh, the guy from South Carolina, his name is oh. escaping me now. We have Sydney lots Baxter. of pieces by him. Um, um, Jonathan. Jonathan Green. Jonathan Green. Um, when I got my like first really big promotion, uh, I worked at Nationwide for 25 years. And I got, you know, this wonderful office and I wanted to buy a piece of art for myself. And I bought two pieces based upon two promotions. Uh, one was a piece by Queen Brooks. Um, it's called Life After Life. And I really liked it because it reminded me I needed to get a life. Um, and I'm still working on that. And then the other piece was by Jonathan Green many of them, but this one was called The Escorting of Ruth, and it's a depiction of Jonathan Green's mother um, pregnant in a boat with the midwives going across the water um, to deliver him, and it's a beautiful depiction, and, and that whole notion of, of birth and uh, you know, him capturing that moment, um, but pretty special to me, so those are two pieces that uh, I, I wouldn't really want to ever part with. Well, I was um, also thinking about the person. It is about the network of people and the, those you gather around you. Percy King has, a, but has a story here at the museum because of that piece. Um, it was being uh, shown with some other work at uh, for an evening event at the Lincoln in the ballroom. And I went and I had never seen Percy's work before. I was I was just blown away. I talked to him a little bit and I said, well, we need to get together. And um, then we both went our separate ways and we were doing like a million things. And then one day I was coming out of the cafe at the museum, he was coming in and we went, we haven't talked. And we did then. And the museum commissioned um, uh, the uh, a group of pictures from him about great artists in Columbus. So he did one of Amina, one of Elijah Pierce, one of Kojo, and one of uh, William Hawkins. I think there's four. And then when he came to deliver different, you know, these, they're wonderful. And uh, when he came to deliver different ones, uh, he said, I, I thought I should give you a gift too. And he gave us this fantastic piece uh, that's about he does a lot of work with musicians and music and it's a piece that, that in fact, all of the young ones that come, that's the piece they're all very attracted to. And then they kind of fold back into learning who these other art, visual artists are. Yeah, if I could echo on yeah. that. The way we um, met Percy, um, Donna was in the office of Center for Healthy Families um, and Percy was uh, visiting her and Donna calls and says, there's this artist with this unique work you might understand it. You, you got to see it. So I go down and Percy was doing basically uh, hip hop artists and things of that sort. And they were huge. And I said, Percy, you know, there's a conservative group of us that maybe you want to do ball one or, you know, some of our cultural giants. And um, I said, we're having a kickoff of the Harlem Renaissance Initiative. Why don't you bring your work? but bring a piece that, you know, might appeal to me, okay? And uh, he had it all covered up, and he, we go through the, the rollout, and, and we identify Percy, and he pulls the cover off the Obama piece. Just amazing. And it was just extraordinary. So Donna didn't know, that, know this at this time, but I didn't give her a gift. I split the cost of buying that piece with her. Yeah. You have always talked sometimes. about Donna's pocketbook as part of this project. <laughs> well, I think the um, the important thing is, um, you know, the Columbus community, I think, has been conservative as to supporting art. You know, Tom and GCAC 
you know, spearheaded the initiative to create that arts tax. And we are, otherwise we're collectively begging. And Don and I thought as a black couple, we need to take that banner. And we are just so much stronger together than we are apart. And we thought we should set that benchmark. Um, and it's something that we have, have been doing now for 32 years. I'm gonna let that be the final word. Um, I do wanna say though, if you want to know, if you're like, I don't know Percy King, when you go out, you, instead of turning right to go down the stairs, you want, just take a quick look left right outside where the barrel is. Probably for me, other than the Obama portrait, one of the most important works that Percy ever did. I, I was so grateful that I was looking at his website like the day he posted it. It's a work about George Floyd. It's incredibly important. We acquired it uh, from him and I've got a lot of people very jealous that we did that. So please look at that piece. It's an extraordinary piece. Please enjoy your evening. Go down the galleries are still open it, and yeah. there's a long run. This is like till the 20. Are you gonna say something to the whole crowd, my friend? Yes, yes. Congresswoman Beatty is with us as our honored guest this evening. I will be I will be very brief. I just want to say the two most important words we can say, and that's thank you to you, Donna and Larry. And I think I can speak for everyone here, Nanette. You often say that the Com Columbus Museum of Art is built for the community. And then you add it by the community. Tonight makes it really by the community when we think about the diversity of this community. But on a more personal note, Donna and Larry have been giants in this community, but not just for the arts, giants for our children, Donna, all that you've done for little black girls and women. Then when I think of what you've done in corporate America to set the stage that others could follow in your footprints, and Larry, what you've done in the law, what you've done for the community and for civil rights and human rights, and tonight in the arts. So when we think of them and their leadership and all that they've done, tonight speaks to living legacy, living legends, not only in the art, but we're talking about you. It builds hope. It reminds us of the dignity and the proudness of being black. And so when we think of this today, a combination of Lawrence Jacobs, a combination of Amina Robinson, and so many more. We say thank you, job well done, and I'm just proud that I know y'all. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, my friends. It um, the uh, Don and Larry show goes through October. We're really uh, up into early October. So we're going to run it really long. Lots of opportunity to come and visit us. Please don't be a stranger. See you soon. Take care and drive safely home.